Felix here, and welcome to this live stream. This is going to be the biggest day of the year in many ways. It's the first rate hike, well, the first expected rate hike. The market has a 96% probability on this rate hike coming at quarter of a percent, and the first one in many, many years. It's the end of an era of free, easy money, money printing to a degree that we have never seen before in the history of the United States, or any sensible market for that place. And what we are about to witness is not just what are they going to do about the actual rate hike here, and I'm just playing a few uh, channels in the background, but really we're looking at this here. We're looking at the forward mo motion. We basically know it's going to be a quarter of a percent, right? 250 basis points. Really what we're looking at is what is the message beyond that? What insight is Powell going to give us in his press conference speech, which we will live stream here shortly, in terms of how does Ukraine crisis impact this? What is he thinking about energy inflation? What is he, what is he thinking about food inflation? Rates that are all at a 10% plus. How does he think the geopolitical instability due to the Ukraine war will impact GDP growth? Because we are also going to get the Fed's GDP outlook here. And that's really what the market's going to move by. If we're getting a quarter of a percent increase in interest rates here, the market's just going to be like, yeah, okay. And in fact, we probably get a rally. And I'm with um, Tax the Penguin here at the top of the chat. Welcome uh, on, on that front. And I should always start this off by saying this is not financial advice. This is hopefully vaguely entertaining and educational, which is the, 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 the mantra of our channel here to be vaguely entertaining, you know, to be educational as you help to get you to financial freedom faster. So I think the market would rally on a quarter percent hike if there is a slightly more conservative outlook in terms of, you know, we'll have to review how many times we increase rates this year rather than the kind of bullish stance that we had about a month ago. That's really what we're looking out for here. So we're trying to read between the lines. And that's why I think it's very, very important to actually listen to these because if you read, you know, the Reuters or the CNBC take on it or something, they're going to come up with like one headline and 150 words and then that's it. Whereas the guy's going to speak for like quite a while. So the, I always think getting, getting the first time information is absolutely uh, fantastic. So, we had a crazy day today. Absolutely, we're still having a crazy day, right? So, if we put this to the side for one moment, well, okay, this is the dot plot, right? That what we're looking at. Basically, what it means is that these light blue numbers, the consensus for the year so far is, you know, 0 0.8 or something uh, percent interest rate by the end of the year. In reality, that's going to shift up substantially. But how far is that going to shift up? That's really what we want to see. We want to see where that goes. And we also want to see where that goes for 2023. Are they more conservative or are they looking at, you know, 2%, 2.5% plus in terms of, in, of, of interest rates? That's really what we need to look for here. Uh, at the moment, we basically know, well, we don't know, but there's a 98% chance of a quarter percent interest rate hike today, according to the futures, the market, uh, basically the bond market and, and so on. And that's not a guarantee as, as, you know, as an options trade that has a 90% probability, it can still go against you, but it's very, very, very likely. Um, some of you guys are asking whether the Chinese stocks are going to rally more if this happens. So I think this affects more like the whole market as a whole. This does not really affect Chinese or American stocks more than one or the other. This is just either good or bad for tech stocks in particular. Right? Your value stocks, your quality stocks, your stocks with lots of free cash flow and lots of profits are not going to be as affected by this as, as, uh, as are the profitable uh, stocks. So if you look at our, our stock tracker here, you know, which I always encourage you to do, put your portfolio in here and then zoom over and look at the ones that are making money. How do you know they're making money? Well, they have positive returns on equity, for example. They have um, PE numbers that are actually positive and, you know, sizable. That's kind of what you want to look for here. You want to look at earnings per share growth that's positive and so on. Looking for those kind of stocks, you know, your your Starbucks is going to be less affected than by this, but then your your Palantir simply because Starbucks, well, normally makes a lot of money. Uh, Palantir uh, doesn't yet, or your IDEX makes a lot of money, whereas your Starbucks that doesn't. So that's really the impact here. It's the impact is very very much on growth. So a hawkish Fed chap 
who basically comes out and says, well, you know, inflation is the biggest concern ever. We're really worried about it. It's, you know, heading to 10%. We need to do something about it. This is our number one focus. The market would hate that. And the market would hate that simply because we value our growth stocks based on DCFs, discounted cash flow models. And it's the discount that basically gets bigger as that gets bigger as interest rates go up, right? That's the problem here. Same with inflation, though. As inflation goes up, the discount also goes up, which is why we've had this massive sell-off. Starbucks ex-CEO coming back. Nazi. yes, I, I, I did also see that. I, I don't know that much about them. I do actually have quite a bit of Starbucks, but I don't know that much about the ex-CEO versus the, the present CEO and which one was the better kind of, uh, um, you know, keeper of the whole thing. If I just put... Um, this on here it's silent for you guys but let me just see if we have anything out yet um no everyone's just talking about the countdown let me put that on for a second see what, F what jp morgan has to say it's next year as well michael let's dust off the textbooks you're the only one who's ever come out of booth school who read every single word of john maynard Keynes. we know that quite well and one of the phrases from back then we're reliving now which is money illusion which is how we how central bankers behave given high inflation 98.2 percent of our audience has never experienced that what's the money illusion jay powell has to pay attention to in the coming year or two i think perhaps one element of the money illusion is uh focusing on nominal interest rates so if inflation expectations are moving higher then the uh, level of nominal interest rates that will lead, lead to higher real interest rates subsequently has to be higher. So I think that is one reason why they're pretty focused on inflation expectations, that they drift higher. Not only is that a problem, but that means they're chasing a higher nominal rate that would lead to restrictive uh, real interest rates. So I think that's one aspect of uh, money illusion that, that hopefully Powell doesn't lose sight of in, in the coming quarters. Michael, one area that I think you may disagree with Priya Misra of TD Securities on is just whether the Fed will signal a restrictive stance at some point in the future. You indicated that they probably would signal six rate hikes this year, three the following year, two in 2024, which would take that end rate to a uh, to a restrictive level. Why do you yeah. think they're going to make that? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the economic conditions call for restrictive po policy right now. The uh, unemployment rate is looking like it's going to be below uh, the natural rate for the entire forecast horizon. Inflation has already beaten all of their fate goals. Uh, and so there is a reason that they should cool the economy off. Uh, so I think the economic case for restrictive uh, policy is evident in any, any simple policy rule you want to look at and just basic common sense about how monetary policy affects aggregate demand and hence uh, inflation over time. Hey, Mike, I know you've got to run before the decision. Five minutes. Appreciate your time. Michael Ferrari there of JP Moore. Okay. We literally have five minutes here till we get a decision here. What JP Morgan was just saying, by the way, the world's largest financial institution, if you hadn't realized that, um, they, they kind of move markets quite substantially through the assets that they manage, uh, basically saying we should have restrictive policy. We should have substantial number of interest rate rises, maybe six this year, which would take us up. How far? About one and a half percent higher than we are right now. So we end the year at about 1.75, maybe even 2%. That's what they're calling for because they kind of want to cool the market. And you know why they're also calling for that? Because banks make more money when interest rates are higher, especially when interest rates are rising, because they have massive deposits and they get to take those massive deposits and buy government bonds with it, get a higher interest rate, but they do not pass the higher interest rate on to you, the saver. So therefore, they make substantially more money. And that's always why you see when interest rates go up and when, when inflation goes up, actually, it's the banks. And they're one of the few stocks that really profit from this uh, here. So we literally have a couple of minutes here. Um, TG asking, what will happen when the Fed starts liquidating their, their balance sheet? Well, that's exactly what we're looking out for. Like, what are they going to do with the money shredder? So, you know, we've been printing money, but the intention or the, the expectation is that from June onwards, we will see shredding taking place. And by shredding, I mean kind of literally money shredding. I mean, they don't have to f shred the physical stuff. Simply what they do is at the moment, every month, right, they are buying a vast 
amount of government bonds. And those government bonds have typically an expiration of one to three months. So that means they expire every one to three months. And what are they doing at the moment? At the moment, they're rolling over all of that money that they bought or all of that debt that they bought over the last year or so, and they roll it over every month and they keep buying. So the expectation is that from June onwards, they will reduce the amount that they roll over by about $100 billion per month. So if they kind of indicate that they're going to stick with that, we'll be fine. The market is expecting that. If they indicate that they might up that a little bit, if they indicate, hey, maybe we should do 150 billion or something like that per month, then that would not be good news for the market because it would essentially reduce the amount of money out there, the amount of cheap money out there substantially. It would make funds more expensive. It would mean that investors would seek uh, to fly into, into the safe havens. And that's, of course, not what we want, especially if you invested in anything tech or growthy or anything that's perceived as more risky than, say, your, your average kind of blue chip stock, right? Now, if you want to really understand all of this, is all part of my financial freedom program. I, I am a former economist and former banker and former corporate lawyer and so on. Uh, all of that is packed into the financial freedom program. So if you really want to understand how economics impacts your investment and market psychology and how you actually make those discounted cash flow models so that you become basically your own analysts and much, much more, check out our financial freedom program. It will get you onto the path to financial freedom really, really fast. So felixfranz.org slash stocks and that coupon is available valid till the end of the week. It's 41% off. Uh, check that out while you can. You can also give us a call. My lovely um, Cheryl, who's been with me for over 10 years, uh, will we'll take your call and will guide you through, answer all of your questions uh, on, on the programs and tell you very, very honestly what is and isn't right for you. So do check that out. Now, um, we have a couple of minutes here left um literally a couple of minutes tops till we get that announcement so the way this normally works is we get the announcement in two minutes and we then get about half an hour after that jay powell doing a press conference so we're basically frantically uh, going here through every news source there is uh, Yahoo already has a headline out says uh, stocks climb as Fed raises rates for the first time. But then when you open the article, they say it's expected. So they haven't got the news any faster than we do. And, and we don't expect that to come out uh, until literally in, in about one minute or so. I also have the Fed on here. We might get a press release any second now, but I think they are sticklers there for timing. I don't think they're going to give it to us early uh, at least they've never done that in the past. But anyway, we shall hit refresh and see if they do. And in the moment, meantime, we got um, Bloomberg here in the background just to make sure we, we don't miss anything. Claudia's asking, what do you think are the chances of the CSRC, the Chinese SEC, opening their books to the U.S.? Look, I sort of think that's the only way out of this mess. And I think the U.S. has made that fairly clear. The statement today was certainly the most bullish that I've seen so far. Before, they always said, hey, we are talking. But they never said we are actually making steps towards an actual specific solution. And that's what they were saying today. Uh, and therefore, I'm a little bit more optimistic on it, but I don't count my political chickens until they've hatched, much like my options trades. Don't count on profits or, or good news until it really is out. So the proof will be in the pudding, as, uh, you know, as, as they say in the kitchen. Uh, PG saying, I need 40% put back into my growth portfolio. You basically need your portfolio to go up another 40%. Look, I mean, growth, you need to have a long-term horizon because it is very, very volatile. But I would encourage you to look fundamentally at what those stocks are. Are those businesses good? Are their margins improving? And, and all of that. I mean, uh, PG, I know you've been watching me for a long time and I really appreciate that. Uh, put them into our stock tracker. See what numbers you actually can get your hands on, what gross margins you can get your hands on and so on and see their leverage and everything else and really dig deep. Dig deeper than you ever dug before for your stocks. You can get your hands on this again on felixfranz.org slash Patreon down below. It's like 20 cents a day to join us and join us for the year. You get an extra free month off as well. Um, so we still haven't got the news out yet. We are still very, very, very much waiting for it. It should be out now, but let's hit refresh here. Let's see if... Okay, the Fed. CNBC has it first. Let me see if the Fed has it here. 
Let me look, see if we can get the original document. In the meantime, we shall read uh, what CNBC, they're very, very quick here sometimes, aren't they? Well done, Jeff Cox at CNBC. They approved the first interest rate increase in more than three years, an incremental salvo to address, address spiraling inflation. And the policy making federal uh, FOMC said it'll raise rates by a quarter of a percent. That's what the market expected. And along with the rate hikes, the committee also penciled in a rate hike at each of the six remaining meetings this year, pointing to consensus fund rate of 1.9 by year end. The committee sees three more hikes in 2023 than none the following year. So there we have it. Uh, JP Morgan uh, it was, was spot on, basically. And in the meeting statement, I hope we can get our hands on the original statement here. They haven't put it out yet. How very strange. How very strange it isn't out yet. But we will, we will get uh, the full testimony, so to speak, in, in a moment here. But let's just run through what CNBC is saying. So in a post-meeting statement, they said um, it anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate addressing their $1.9 trillion balance sheet. In addition, the committee expects to begin reducing its holdings of Treasury securities at a coming meeting. So we were expecting that in June. That looks like it's, it's, it's in line. And the central bank slashed its federal fund rates on. Okay, this is just like fluff that they're adding here at the end. Okay, so the news is basically quarter percent interest rate hike as we expected. We are expecting six more and that will take us to 1.9% interest rate by the end of the year. Now, is that what we were expecting? Pretty much. Um, so let me get the dot plot out here. So... Essentially, what's happened here, let me let me show you this on a chart. I've got one up here, is that our the shift from where we were, this is the chart where we are expecting interest rates to be from the last meeting, and this is now gonna go up to basically here. This is now where consensus is. So this is where what the new one's going to look like. That will be deleted. So we've seen that very, very substantial. And then we would expect two more interest rate increases in 2023, which again would mean we would be somewhere around here and all of that will be gone. So you can see a very, very significant shift up this year in 2022 and then a more cautious approach as we head into 2023. Now, let me just see what um, Bloomberg's going to say here. Let me crank that up a little for you. Go up significantly and then drop by more than two percentage points by 2024. Going to go through this price action, Mike. We fade on the equity market on the S&P up eight or nine tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq up by 1.7. Looking at the bond market yields up at the front end on twos. Can we get to that and just look at treasuries? What a move up nine yeah. basis points to 193.79, pushing 220 now on tens up by four or five basis points. This was never about the 25 basis point pop. It wasn't even about the descent from Jim Bullard looking for 50. It is all about that dot plot. Mike, to see 22 go to about 1.9%, then 2.8% for 23. Think about where this dot plot was just two, three months ago. And you have uh, five members of the Open Market Committee saying we could be over 3% in 2023. So there is some disagreement over how far they're going to have to go to bring the inflation genie <coughs> back to the bottle, let alone stuff it back inside. This is a big change, Bramo, a big change for this Fed finally catching up. I have to say, out of all the hawks out there on Wall Street who were looking for six, seven hikes through 22, they were laughed at. I think even some of those didn't expect to see that actually materialize in the dot yeah. plot. This this time around 2.2 uh, 2.8% by the end of next year is that putting that in restrictive territory by the end of next year at a time when people are already talking about slowing growth and I do wonder Mike uh, whether that seems to be uh, the implication here and frankly in markets you're seeing those yield curves flatten with the gap between five-year and 30-year Treasury yields going to the narrowest since 2018 well, they're telling you that they're going to have to be restrictive at this point, which is a fairly hawkish statement for them to make with all the uncertainty still out there. Okay, so essentially, we're seeing a substantial increase in interest rates over the next 
12 and 24 months, um, near 2% by the end of the year, and then possibly up to 2.8% in 2023. Now, one thing you have to always bear in mind, and let's just see how the how the tech market's reacting to this here, here live. Um, what are we seeing? What are we seeing on the QQQ? Let me just open that up and show you an intraday chart. QQQ. Let's see how the market is actually interpreting this on a minute by minute chart. Now, this might not look much, but you see you see a little bit that, right? You see, when I magnify this a little bit uh, in scale, uh, you can see the market reaction isn't like, I mean, not, they're not thrilled, right? They're not like, oh my God, this is wonderful news. So it's coming in a little bit more on the hawkish side, but overall the market is still up 1.5% today. So it also isn't the end of the world. And you can see that nice recovery playing here uh, from, from the, the kind of immediate panic and those who just read the headline. Now, what does this actually mean for the economy? Well, I think one thing that you have to always bear in mind is that the Fed governs through emotion and through expectation and through projecting this is what we're going to do over the next 12 months or the next 24 months. They, the more bullish they are, in what they put out as a statement. And the more we believe it as investors, the less they actually have to do. Because the expectation of significant interest rate rises will in itself moderate investment. It will in itself affect the market and allow the market to sort of self-correct a bit. And therefore, I always take what they say with a bit of a pinch of salt, and they don't actually have to necessarily uh, pull through on that. Now, they also know that we know that. So we know that they know that they know that we know. You know, we kind of go around in a bit of a circle. But it doesn't necessarily mean that what they said today is, is what's going to happen in 2023. Because remember what they said about three months ago, right? Which was also the exact opposite or six months ago or one year ago. So they do have the liberty to change their mind significantly. And they tend to do that. So I think the market is also ca catching on to that. Uh, though you can see here, it is coming down a bit, but it's still a green day that we've lost probably about 0.3% here uh, since pre the announcement. Uh, Alison, I'm always calm. I, I aim to be calm. I mean, we have sort of seen it all before. It's happened all before. It goes up and down. Fundamentally, what really matters is whether your stocks are good stocks, right? What are your margins? What are your ROEs? What are your ratios? What are your long-term earnings per share growth? That's really what matters whether or not you make money. Uh, a a short-term interest rate decision doesn't really make or lose your money in the long run unless you are highly invested in, in uh, you know, U.S. treasuries, which most of you are not. So I would always start with this kind of data. Go to felixfrenzel.org slash Patreon down below. Get your pause on this sheet. Put your portfolio in it. Put your, your, your stock checked in here. It'll give you all this data straight away. And it's like 20 cents a day. So, so come and join us and actually make one step towards becoming a, a smarter investor. Um, now, we are now waiting essentially for Jay Powell to speak. Um, this is the, uh, the very sexy Federal Reserve website I've got open here. We're waiting for that live stream uh, shortly and it'll come out shortly. And this is another interesting statement here on the Fed. And let me see if we can pull up the full statement. I'm still waiting for it uh, on the website. Here it is. There is the full release. So we can actually open that. Projections. Let's have a look. Summary of the economic projections. Oh, it's only 17 pages. Right, here we go. So what have we got? Change in real GDP this year. They expect... 2.8%. So that's substantially down, right? That's 1.2% below what we had in December. So they're expecting less GDP growth. They're expecting unemployment to stick around at 35 They don't expect that to fall any further. And then they expect a core inflation rate of 4.1% by the end of the year. I'd say that's rather optimistic. And there's a footnote with that. We're going to have to find out what that is. In, in December, they were expecting 2.7%. Um, I think we are more likely to head for, but this is core, cool, right? I think we are more likely to head for like seven or something like that. What's the footnote? Longer run projections for core PCE inflation are not collected. Okay, whatever that means. And let's have a look at the range here of what they expect. 
3.6 to 4.5. So there are some people who do expect it to be a little higher, but not that much higher. Now, they think basically GDP is going to flatten off a little bit, GDP growth. They think unemployment is going to stay pretty much flat. And inflation, they also expect, expect this miraculous drop here. Why do they expect that? Well, part of it is because if they say it, they, they sort of get it. That's got something to do with that. And here we have this dot plot I was just showing you. So that would be worth screenshotting, I think, so that we can have a, a quick comparison to what it is and what it was. So you can really see the impact here, what has changed. We had a significant policy shift here as we are live. So this is this is kind of, you know, economic history being made. It was the first time we are in such a zero environment for so long. So if I just delete the old and the new, this was December. This is March. And it doesn't take a genius to work out that in for 2020, we were expecting 1% basically in, uh, interest rates. And we are now expecting for 2020, 1.9%. So it's gone from 1% to 1.9% in 2022. And then for 2023, we were previously expecting about 1.7. And we are now expecting, what is that? I'd say that's about 2.75, maybe 2.8, something like that, 2.8%. I'm guessing here slightly based on that. So again, that is a massive, massive move up from here to there and from here to there. So is this what we expected? I think sort of. I think six interest rate rises promised. They don't have to pull through on that as sort of what we were expecting. So it isn't a huge shock which is why markets are not completely freaking out. Though, let's just go back to the live QQQ here for a sec and see, well, look at that. More people are reading the news and we've now lost most of the gains of the day today, at least half the gains. This is a minute chart here, so don't be freaked out. The difference isn't that huge. We've gone from 335 to 330. And then if we look at our tech stocks, China is still flying, absolutely. Neo is still up 16, 17%. But when you go to the bottom end here, we are seeing some stocks going now into the negative territory, like the Trump SPAC, Peloton, CrowdStrike, and, and Apple and so on, losing a little bit here. Um, so far, actually still up, but it's still a green day. It's still a pretty good day. We really can't complain about a day like today. Now, let's have a look at... Um, some of this. So these are projections for unemployment, um, PCE inflation expectations. So there is one person here who expects us to have five point plus in inflation by the end of the year. And I think he's probably the one that's right. Okay, let's just uh, have a look at some more of these numbers that they put out. This is the Fed report that they put out. It's very sexy. I know this document is, but at least, at least this way you get to see the first-hand information. Um, okay, here are some caveats in this. FOMC participants' assessment of uncertainty and risk. They think GDP growth could be higher. That could be the risk here, in which case we get more inflation, in which case they might need to do more. So there is that, which the market isn't going to like. Okay, lots and lots and lots of charts here. And change in real GDP. Okay, that's all about uncertainty. Let's scroll down a little bit more. So this is basically the caveats. That's what they're, what they're looking at here. And here are the historical projection and error ranges. And... Um, they're expecting a basically plus minus and a half percent. So that's a pretty wide range, isn't it? For unemployment plus minus 0.8 percent. And then it goes out a little bit further. So essentially, yeah, forecast uncertainty, because as you know, economists are mostly wrong. <laughs> that's why I, I never really became one as a job. Now, what does the, the market say? What are the news? How are they reporting this? Is this still all about the Ukraine um, the Fed hikes rate signals aggressive turn against inflation. That's really not what we want to hear as growth investors. And the statement dropped a direct reference to the coronavirus pandemic, but in instead 
cited the Ukraine was creating additional upward pressure on inflation and weighing on economic activity. The interest rate path shown in the new projections is tougher than expected. That's Reuters' view on this. So they are getting a little bit more tougher on inflation here. And put at risk, the central banks hope for an easy shift out of the emergency policies. And... Yeah, so that's basically what we have here. So we've got about 10 minutes or so until Jay Powell speaks, and that would be kind of an interesting one to really hear it from the horse's mouth, uh, what's going to happen. So, uh, Vengador, uh, thanks for just joining. I think the 0.25% in uh, increase, that's always expected. That was never the concern here. But what is the concern is that they are looking to raise six more times this year. They're looking to raise further in 2023. And that's putting a dampener on the market as we speak. We've lost about a percentage point of um, NASDAQ gains uh, since this has come out. Uh, and banks, uh, you're quite right. Banks should be flying. This should be good news for, for, for banks. But... The market is so irrational in the shorter term, and I think that's what we always need to appreciate and we need to basically profit from. Volatility is a good thing for option sellers, for example, like myself and my students. We can make a lot of money in every scenario. We just have to understand really how it works, where it starts, where it stops, and what's causing what. And then you can tell, well, this is irrational. Therefore, I can I can make money by going against the herd here. One of the core things I, I teach you in our master stock, our financial freedom program, is exactly that. Understanding market psychology, understanding the economics, understanding the core valuations of your stocks. So you you can confidently go against the herd, which again and again and again makes money. So check out felixfrenzelorg slash stocks. Check out that coupon code there, life-changing. That's not on the website. So write that down, life-changing. And that's because that is what the program really is. That's what my students keep telling me. And that's what we're excited about here. So if you've just joined us here, Fed sees inflation at 4.3% by the end of the year. I think that's probably a little optimistic, but at the same time, they are hammering us with six more interest rate hikes this year. We're going to go up to near 2% interest by the end of the year. Now, what's the market doing about this? Let me just um, move these guys aside and let me show you the live market here. So this is the live ticker. These are mostly growth stocks. Overall, we're still having a pretty good day. But if you look at the QQQ, you can see there has been an impact. This is a minute-by-minute minute chart. Uh, and then there is, again, a little bit of a buyback here. It's still up 1%. So it's holding most of its gains from the day-to-day. -day. And most of our tech stocks are also still. The China sector is still flying. Alibaba is up 27%. Didi up 44%. Um, Neo up 18%. And so on. Really, the whole market just flying, especially anything Chinese. PayPal up 4.4%. Etsy up almost 3%. Tesla at $818, up 2%. Amazon is up. QQQ up now just one percentage point. And Microsoft, the only big fish here that's down 0.4% uh, at the moment. Thomas, have I got an email address? I absolutely do. Uh, you're always very welcome to drop me a message. I'm always glad to hear from you. I'll write it on the screen here so everybody can see it. It's Felix at Goat Academy. dot org. O R G. That's our website. That's our academy, uh, and where we have all of our programs and students and the free materials and everything else. So drop me an email there. Anything vaguely finance related or vaguely, you know, fluffy creatures related. I'm always glad to hear it. Math guy, welcome. Do you think stocks will keep dipping then? Well, I think it'll it'll six interest rate hikes this year will get us quite a bit of volatility. I think that's definitely one thing that's for sure. And that's going to be good for us option sellers, like you are, uh, math guy. Although volatility at the moment coming down is quite substantially, down 5% or so. Let me have a look at, um, where is it? Here we go. Let's have a look at the futures. VIX is down to 29, down to more than 5% today. I know I'm covering that, but I can tell you it's 25, 29 rather. Uh, oil is also below $100 on the hope that there might be some sort of peace deal. Ukraine might become a neutral state, something like that. And overall today, gas prices keep flying because European demand continues to be there. Uh, but wheat prices and the VIX and corn, palladium, this is Russia, right? The whole thing down here is Russia, basically. That's what is, is dampening the speculation on, on those stocks here. 
Uh, treasury yields are increasing quite a bit. Let's look at exactly how much. If we look at the bond yield here, the US 10 year uh, treasury yield is up 4.3% on this. So it certainly means that some bond traders didn't expect quite as many projected rate rises as we are going to get or projected to get by the Fed themselves. So the JP Morgan was pretty much bang on as we started this call. Now, as he says, we're six price hikes priced in already. Well, I think when we look at the market, treasury yields are going up, but we're not seeing a massive massive drop in the stock market right we are, we are losing a little bit of the you know enthusiasm today perhaps people were hoping for a softer stance by the fed because of the ukraine war because of oil prices and so on but they are kind of going going out this fairly aggressively and in a way it makes sense if you want to fight inflation you don't go in and say well i think we might do something about it you go in and say we're going to really hit this one over the head with a big hammer. And by saying that, you might actually need to do less down the road. And that's always the... The Fed is all about emotion. It's all about expectations. It's not really about interest rates or actually how many you know government bonds they buy or, or taper or any of that. It's not about the specific numbers. It's about the impression that they give the market about the sincerity to act and what is their priority. And I think they are rather late to the party. I think they probably could have done six months ago with turning from the inflation doesn't exist to let's do something about it uh, but they're rather late to the party so they are going to have to get the sledgehammer out here a little bit little bit um, though it is sort of as we expected it's just there was hope it could be less than expected that's the way i kind of interpret this Okay, we just got, um, yeah, gold keeps keeps going. Well, it's, it keeps falling again. So that's, again, the Russia crisis possibly being diffused, although I'm not that much of an optimist on that one until that's actually done. Uh, a, you added some Chinese stocks today. I hope not at 40% up. I hope you, you, you were doing that a little, little bit sooner uh, than not. So if you've just joined us, the new dot plot which is this very, very silly chart, which is a little hard to understand, I always think. It basically shows where the Fed presidents expect us to be. So we basically, by the end of 2022, will be at about 1.9% interest rates. And that is, you know, six more hikes this year to get us there. And then by 2023, we expect another one and another two uh, hikes essentially in 2023 and that's pretty much flat that then, then they basically think they're done um and that's perhaps a little bit more than we were expecting there certainly the speed at which they are doing it is perhaps a little more than than the more um kind of hopefully optimistic commentators we're, we're looking at Aku says, smash the like or get out. I appreciate that sentiment, Aku. We are missing about 250 likes here. I'd love it if you smash the like button. It does so much for the algorithm and everything else. We are getting Jay Powell live here in about five minutes. So stick around or get yourself a cup of coffee or something. Uh, Donna say, what do you think about Tiger? Is it worth buying now? I am cautious on those Chinese brokerages as investments. I know it's up a lot. It's up like 27% today. First of all, I don't typically buy things when they're up 27%. So that's probably an overreaction and it might come back down again. And secondly, the whole fintech sector in China, the question is, does the government want ordinary people to invest in US listed equities? Or would they rather that they invest on the Shanghai or the Hong Kong exchanges or the Shenzhen exchanges? I think that's the fundamental question here. And at the moment, companies like Tiger and Futu are sort of in a bit of a gray area here in terms of regulation. And considering the Alibaba experience of the last 15 months, I'm rather not in gray area. So for me, uh, that's, that's a definite no-no. Nazi, what's worse, rate hikes or balance sheet reduction? Hmm. It's essentially the same thing. It's essentially two sides of the same tool. Um, it really doesn't matter which one you do. The Fed and, and, and all the central banks get very, very worried when they haven't got any interest rates to cut, right? When they are at 0 0.25 or 0.5%, they are very, very, very much powerless. The ammunition is spent. They've got one more bullet left to fire. So that's why... 
bankers, central bankers like to get the rates up first so that if there is another recession or some unforeseen event, they have some ammunition where they can go in the market and go, we are cutting rates and it makes them look kind of like they're doing something big. And that's why they do that first. And then, you know, I don't know. Um, it, in a way, they are in increasing rates, but, you know, they are still have massive stimulus in the market. So in, in a rational world, you get rid of the whole balance sheet first and then you'd raise rates. But it's it's much more about emotion and psychology than about actually which tool do you use. At least that's my, my way of looking at that. Claude saying, do you think uh, rising oil prices will lead to more growth in the renewable sector? Yes, and nuclear, if you count nuclear as renewable, which I don't, but that seems to benefit particularly from it. And if you talk to Bill Gates, apparently it is renewable. It's an ESG investment, apparently. So, yes, I do think that helps. I mean, in a sense, also the EV sector and all of that might be helped by that. But at the moment, we have the whole raw material crisis related to the Ukraine and Russia as well. So, And of course, as energy prices go up, electricity prices also go up. So there is this kind of like balance here, right? Do what goes up more, gas prices or electricity prices? Well, people notice gas prices more. So psychologically, again, it has a bigger impact and then, then electricity prices because you only get a random bill once a month. You are not quite sure what you used. People pay a lot less attention to that. So I genuinely encourage you to really understand not just the economics and inflation investing and how to pick greater stocks and so on, but also really, really understand the psychology of the market and your own psychology. We need to master this one up here so that we can become better investors. And that's totally crucial. I teach that in the Financial Freedom Program. Do check it out. I know a lot of you are on that program already and are having tremendous changes in how you invest and, and, and how you plan your future. So check it out, felixrentalog slash stocks. Write down that coupon code there, life-changing. It's going away at the end of the week and it's not on the website. So write down life-changing. And that's my intention with these programs, completely risk-free uh, uh, as well. Okay, so we can see here, you know, also live on Bloomberg, the market is still up. It's still a good day. So um, it's not like the end of the world at all, but it will get digested. We will get some headlines out that are talking about this aggressive approach to inflation. And the question will also be over the next months now again, what do inflation numbers do? And I think inflation is going to keep going up because we haven't seen any of these this energy inflation in the last numbers because there wasn't any and the data is always a little late, right? So as that goes up, uh, we will see more concerns around, you know, there being more rate hikes. Um, and let me just see. So basically, Powell is about to speak any second now. I can put him on either on the sexy Fed website or if Bloomberg streams it, we might just stick with Bloomberg and I'll put the sound on for you guys in, in a moment. Okay, you guys are chatting on whether or not the, the poll stars look good. Um, that's, oh, you know, everything, it's, it's a question of taste, isn't it? Um, not that you have it or you don't have it, it's just tastes are fundamentally different. So let me just see here. Let me look for our live stream for Jay Powell. He should be talking right here, right now, basically. Let me pause Bloomberg. And, okay, nothing so far but they will go live pretty much now. <laughs> um, it is it is 2.30 p.m. In, uh, in on the East Coast, is it not? I, I think so. Here we go. Good afternoon. I want to begin by acknowledging the tremendous hardship the Ukrainian people are suffering as a result of Russia's invasion. The human toll is tragic. The financial and economic implications for the global economy and the U.S. economy are highly uncertain. At the Federal Reserve, we are strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. Today, in support of these goals, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by one quarter percentage point. The economy is very strong and against the backdrop of an extremely tight labor market and high inflation. The committee anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate. 
In addition, we expect to begin reducing the size of our balance sheet at a coming meeting. Economic activity expanded at a robust 5.5% pace last year, reflecting progress on vaccinations and the reopening of the economy, fiscal and monetary policy support, and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. The rapid spread of the Omicron variant led to some slowing in economic activity early this year, but cases have declined sharply since mid-January, and the slowdown seems to have been mild and brief. Although the invasion of Ukraine and related events represent a downside risk to the outlook for economic activity, FOMC participants continue to foresee solid growth. As shown in our summary of economic projections, the median projection for real GDP growth stands at 2.8% this year, 2.2% next year, and 2% in 2024. The labor market has continued to strengthen and is extremely tight. Over the first two months of the year, employment rose by more than a million jobs. In February, the unemployment rate hit a post-pandemic low of 3.8%, a bit below the median of committee participants' estimates of its longer-run normal level. The improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, and while labor force participation has increased somewhat, labor supply remains subdued. As a result, employers are having difficulties filling job openings, and wages are rising at their fastest pace in many years. FOMC participants expect the labor market to remain strong, with the median projection for the unemployment rate declining to 3.5% by the end of this year and remaining near that level thereafter. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Aggregate demand is strong, and bottlenecks and supply constraints are limiting how quickly production can respond. These supply disruptions have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated, exacerbated by waves of the virus here and abroad, and price pressures have spread to a broader range of goods and services. Additionally, higher energy prices are driving up overall inflation. The surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine will put additional upward pressure on near-term inflation here at home. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We know that the best thing we can do to support a strong labor market is to promote a long expansion, and that is only possible in an environment of price stability. As we emphasize in our policy statement, with appropriate firming in the stance of monetary policy, we expect inflation to return to 2% while the labor market remains strong. That said, inflation is likely to take longer to return to our price stability goal than previously expected. The median inflation projection of FOMC participants is 4.3% this year and falls to 2.7% next year and 2.3% in 2024. This trajectory is notably higher than projected in December and participants continue to see risks as weighted to the upside. <clears throat> the Fed's monetary policy actions have been guided by our mandate to promote, promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. <clears throat> our policy has been adapting to the evolving economic environment, and it will continue to do so. As I noted, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by one quarter percentage point, and anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. The median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 1.9% at the end of this year, a full percentage point higher than projected in December. Over the following two years, the median projection is 2.8%, somewhat higher than the median estimate of its longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee decision or plan, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. <clears throat> Reducing the size of our balance sheet will also play an important role in firming the stance of monetary policy. At our meeting that wrapped up today, the committee made good progress on a plan for reducing our securities holdings, and we expect to announce the beginning of balance sheet reduction at a coming meeting. In making decisions about interest rates and the balance sheet, we will be mindful of the broader context in markets and in the economy, 
and we will use our tools to support financial and macroeconomic stability. As we noted in our policy statement, the implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine for the U.S. economy are highly uncertain. In addition to the direct effects from higher global oil and commodity prices, the invasion and related events may restrain economic activity abroad and further disrupt supply chains, which would create spillovers to the U.S. economy through trade and other channels. The volatility in the financial markets, particularly if sustained, could also act to tighten credit conditions and affect the real economy. Making appropriate monetary policy in this environment requires a recognition that the econ economy often evolves in unexpected ways. We will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. And we will strive to avoid adding uncertainty what is, to what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain moment. We are attentive to the risks of potential further upward pressure on inflation and inflation expectations. The committee is determined to take the measures necessary to restore price stability. The American economy is very strong and well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission we at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Gina at the New York Times. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you so much for taking our questions. I wonder if you could detail your thinking a little bit about how you're considering the, you know, the risks of going too fast and potentially tipping the economy into recession and how you're weighing those risks against the possibility of going too slowly allowing inflation to become embedded and, and kind of getting behind the curve? So um, I guess I would start by saying that, in my view, the probability of a recession within the next year is not particularly elevated. And why do I say that? Aggregate demand is currently strong, and most forecasters expect it to remain so. If you look at the labor market, also very strong. Conditions are tight, and payroll job growth is continuing at very high levels. Household and business balance sheets are strong. And so all signs are that this is a strong economy, in, indeed uh, one that uh, will be able to uh, flourish, not to say withstand, but certainly uh, flourish as well um, in the face of less accommodative monetary policy. So uh, I guess that's how, how I would say I'm looking at that. Of course, the objective is to achieve price stability while also sustaining a strong labor market, and that, that is our overall objective. But we do feel the economy is very strong and well positioned to withstand tighter monetary policy. Thank you. Let's go to Howard at Reuters. Uh, hi, uh, Chair Pell. I was wondering, in the um, in the SEPs, you have quite a markdown to uh, GDP from 4 to 2.8%. I'm wondering, how much of that do you feel is the result of the, the Fed's stiffer than expected action here? Uh, we talk about monetary policy operating with a, a lag, but is this going to bite quicker than expected? I, I don't think that's a big piece of it, actually. I, th I think some of that is just uh, an early assessment of the effects of, uh, of uh, spillovers from uh, the war in Eastern Europe, which will hit our economy through a number of channels. Highly uncertain, but uh, you know, you're, you're looking at higher oil prices, higher commodity prices. It'll be uh, so that we think that will weigh on GP to some extent. So that's part of what moved uh, moved the ass those assessments down. I don't think. I mean, I think generally monetary policy works with a lag. So some of that would would also be in there. But uh, remember as well that 2.8 percent is still very strong growth. If we think that we think that the potential growth rate of the economy is somewhere between somewhere around one and three quarters percent, 2.8 percent is strong economic growth. It would have been one of the strongest years, in fact, of the last expansion. So while it's lower than uh, last year's 5.8 percent, it's still quite strong growth. That's so I would say it's a, it's a quite a strong forecast. So, so in that in that context, what would uh, uh, tr trigger you to go faster or slower on the rate hikes? Ongoing increases doesn't really tell us whether this is going to come in bigger chunks or, or or evenly paced through the year. Yeah. So you know the way we're the way we're thinking about this is that every meeting is a live meeting. And uh, we're going to be looking at evolving conditions. And uh, if we do conclude that it would be appropriate to, to move more quickly to remove accommodation, then we'll do so. I can't be 
perfectly specific about it, but that's certainly a possibility as we as we go through the year. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Rachel at the Washington Post. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Chair Powell, for taking our questions. I'm curious if you can be specific on when you expect to see inflation will start to come down, especially with the combination of rates going up, uh, fiscal aid dissipating from the economy, and supply chains getting better. And if you don't start to see that, how will you signal it? What will you be looking for, and what will you be looking for over the course of the year? Thank you. So I, I guess I would say that at, at the um, if you t if before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So let's go back to that. I, I would have said that the expectation was that inflation would peak sometime in the first quarter, maybe the end of the first quarter of this year, and um, and then maybe stay at that level or a little bit lower, and then start to come down in the back half of the year. So now we're you know we're getting uh, we're going we're already seeing uh, a, a little bit of short term upward pressure in inflation due to higher oil prices. Uh, not natural natural gas a little bit, but not so much for us since we have our own natural gas supply. Other commodities prices. The other thing is that um, you're seeing uh, supply chain issues around shipping, and around you know lots of um, countries and companies and people not wanting to to touch Ru uh, Russian goods. So that's that's going to be more more tangled supply chains. So that could actually push out the relief we were expecting on supply chains generally. So I, I, I guess I would say that the, the, the expectation is still that inflation will begin to come down in the second half of the year. But if you look at where the I, I read the, the SEP headline median, we still expect inflation, inflation to be high this year, lower than last year. And then we, uh, we expect, though, particularly with the effects of the war, but also the, uh, the data we've seen so far this year, we expect inflation to remain high through the middle of the year, begin to come down, and then come down more sharply next year. Let's go to Nick at the Wall Street Journal. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, over the last six months, the Fed has shifted its policy stance quite a bit. Uh, six months ago, you were still buying assets. Uh, most officials weren't projecting any interest rate increases this year. Um, and yet, despite the shift over the last six months, real rates are as negative today as they were then. So how concerned are you that further inflation surprises will offset the effects of uh, recent policy firming by leading real rates to stay at levels that do not actually provide much restraint uh, to the economy. Thanks. So that that's one of, of many ways of capturing uh, the situation, which is that we the, the committee really does understand that uh, the time for uh, for rate increases and for shrinking the balance sheet has come. And um, I, I would just say, uh, I would go back to uh, the economy is very strong, as I mentioned, um, tremendous momentum in the labor market. We expect growth to continue. As I, it's clearly time to raise interest rates and begin the balance sheet shrinkage. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that if, as I looked around the table at today's meeting, I saw a committee that's acutely aware of the need to return the economy to price stability and determined to use our tools to do exactly that. You, you couched it in terms of real rates. Uh, I, I would say if you look at the, the SEP, you've got people getting close to or even above, in, in many cases, their estimate of the longer run neutral rate. So I, I understand that doesn't do it for real rates. But if you go out a year or two, many people are in their forecasts are having, uh, are having tight policy from a real, a real interest rate standpoint. So that, that's something that we're, we're focused on. Of course, it's, it's a highly uncertain environment. and, and uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, and, and but we do know that we're going to deploy our tools uh, uh, to to achieve our goals, and that, that includes the price stability goal. Let's go to Victoria at Politico. Um, hi, Chair Powell. So um, looking at the summary of economic projections, you all have inflation coming down over the course of the year to 4.3%. Um, and then you also have rates going up to what appears to still be below roughly what would be estimated to be the neutral rate, although I know that's a little bit uncertain. So I was just wondering, how much of inflation coming down do you see as actually being as a result of the Fed itself raising rates? Um, and then also, if I could just ask, 
uh, given that Sarah Bloom Raskin withdrew her nomination. Um, what do you expect to do with the regulatory portfolio? Do you expect to assign a governor in charge of that? Okay. So, sorry, tell me, uh, tell me again your first question. My first question is how much do you expect inflation to come ah, down okay. as a direct result of the Fed's yeah. actions? Um, okay, so part of it, part of inflation coming down at the very beginning is clearly to do with factors other than our policy, and those would include potentially the supply chains getting a little bit better, certainly base effects. You're, you're lapping, as you know, when you look at a 12-month trailing window, you're lapping very high inflation in March, April, May, June of last year. So there should be some effects from that in the 12th in the 12 month picture. Really what we're looking for though is month by month inflation coming down. And so it's it's really uh it's all the things we've been talking about you know that that really haven't helped much including the shift away from goods and back to services, including supply chains getting better, including work labor force participation. All those things that have been sticky and and not happening. Um, but a big part of it is, though, is, is the base effects I mentioned as well. You know, I think monetary policy starts to bite uh, it, it, on inflation and on, and on growth uh, with a lag, of course. And so you would see that more in, the, in, uh, in 23 and 24. But re also remember, we started talking about rate increases last year for some months now. The financial conditions, conditions have already incorporated a significant number of rate increases. So it doesn't start today. The, 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 in effect, the moves are already priced into the market for, for a few months now. So um, it, it, so the clock is running on that. And I think some of that will be seen in, in, the, in the second half of the year as well. And on so on the regulatory portfolio, so I, I would just say this, you know, we have an obligation to carry out under the law in, the, in supervision and regulation, and we're doing that. That's, that's what we're doing. Uh, the committee is, is not active. So what's happening is things are coming to the full board and we're voting on them. We're getting our business done. Uh, you know, we got the stress tests done. We've we've looked at a, you know a number of proposals for mergers and things like that. So we are we are we're working ahead. Of course, we don't have a vice chair for supervision, as you mentioned, but we're 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 making do with with the situation we have, and and a good number of things are, are have come straight to the board for approval. Let's go to Neil Irwin at Axios. Let's go to Neil Irwin. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. It's uh, Neil Irwin at Axios. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, in the statement of economic projections, uh, we see a, a forecast of uh, median 1.9% Fed fund rate at the end of the year, 28 uh, end of next year. Wondered whether that aligns with your own expectations, uh, in particular on that point of overshooting the uh, long-term neutral rate. Uh, and also, uh, if you can tell us anything about how that might be paced, front-loaded, back-loaded, how high is the bar for doing 50 at one meeting? So. I, I don't, Neil. I've never um, talked about my own SEC SCP projection. It's in there, but I, I, you know, I think Fed chairs have generally not done that because uh, we just haven't done it. It's because we're, you know, we're, we have to put together the uh, the consensus on the committee and present that consensus. So I wouldn't talk about my uh, my individual one. And in terms of the pacing of it, I would just point out that 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 is there are seven remaining meetings this year. This isn't something we discuss or debate or agree on, but there are seven remaining meetings and there are seven rate hikes. I would add there's also the uh, the, the shrinkage of the balance sheet, which you people do the math different ways, but that might be the equivalent of another rate increase just from the the uh, uh, the, the the runoff of the balance sheet. Um, so I, I don't, but I I don't know. Um, we haven't made any decisions on front end loading or 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 going steadily through the year. And as as I mentioned, you know. Um, uh, if you look at the SEP, a good number of, of participants do see more than seven rate increases this year. And uh, I, I can't give you, I'm not going to try to give you a really specific test for what it would take to do that. But I will say this, though, we'll, we'll be looking at, at, the, at the data as they come in. We'll be looking to see whether the data show expected improvement on inflation. We'll be looking at the inflation outlook and making a judgment. And we'll be going, you know, each meeting is a live meeting. And if, if we conclude that it would be appropriate to raise interest rates more quickly, then, then we'll do so.
This is quite amusing that the Fed can't figure out a live stream, hey? Uh, after the last two years, you would have thought they figured that out. But hey, we, all, we all get it. We all get our IT glitches here. So he made a pretty powerful statement and he fudged it all over. And I think that's really why the market's recovered here. If you watch the screen. Colby Smith at the FT. Let's see how patient he is. To Colby, let's go to Edward Lawrence. Yeah, thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for the question. I have a more basic question. Um, the last time the CPI inflation, I know you look at PCE, but CPI inflation was, was as high as it is, was July of 1981, when the effective federal funds rate was 19.2%. But given the current data, how far behind the curve of inflation do you believe the Federal Reserve is in, in your mind? So I just would say a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I, we have the tools that we need and we're going to use them. And uh, as you can see, we have a plan over the course of this year to raise interest rates steadily and also to run off the balance sheet. Uh, we will take the necessary steps to ensure that high inflation does not become entrenched while also supporting a strong labor market. And as I mentioned, if we conclude that it would be appropriate to move more quickly, we'll do so. Um, I leave it to others to make to make the judgment you ask for. And then just as a, as a follow on that, I wanted to get you on the record on this. Um, what impact has there been on your job, given the fact that you lost you in the middle of the question. Edward, can you repeat that question? The impact um, uh, that given you're not actually confirmed and Governor Brainerd is not actually confirmed, has there been any impact on your job or the, the Fed's ability to handle inflation? None whatsoever. Okay, let's go to Colby Smith at the FT. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Chair Powell, how concerned is the committee about the notable pickup in services inflation, which is perhaps less likely to self-correct? And to what extent does it alter both the committee's confidence that long-term inflation expectations will not de-anchor in the coming months, as well as the balance of risks that the Fed may need to raise interest rates further above neutral than indicated uh, in the dot plot? Thank you. Thank you. So, that, of course, that's something we're, we're watching uh, report by report, and we're certainly what we noticed it in the last meeting. And uh, it's part of the overall picture. Um, we have expected services inflation to move back up to where it was, and that's part of what's happening is, uh, in the case of some services, uh, prices are still getting back up to where they were before the, before the crisis. In other cases, uh, it's pretty clear that, that inflation has spread more broadly across services. And, and yes, that is concerning. In the meanwhile, we see some progress on the good side, but really, at this in this latest report, it was confined to uh, uh, to vehicles, which is admittedly a large uh, a large category. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the committee acutely feels uh, its obligation to to move to um, make sure that we restore price stability, and is determined to use its tools to do so. Thank you. Let's go to Steve Leisman at CNBC. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wonder if you could help me understand the kind of logic, if there is one, in the uh, SCP here. Uh, as I look at the median forecast, for example, for unemployment, it runs for the three-year window below the long run rate. Um, I look at inflation being above over year window, the long run, or call it the neutral rate, so the economy still runs hot. And that is all true in a regime when you run at least for two years the funds rate above the long run rate. So I guess my question is this, are you not create uh, give a forecast here that essentially suggests you will be continuing to run further behind the curve and never really get in front of inflation because the economy will continue to run hot 
And kind of on, on a related issue, you said earlier, um, inflation will take longer to return to price stability than we had originally expected. Isn't that a choice you're making? And if so, why are you making that choice to, inf to let inflation run above price stability longer than, than, you, than you'd like? Right. So our, our, if you look, our, first of all, there is no, you're looking at medians, but understand that, that there's no, it's not something we voted on. It's not a plan. But if you look, people, people do have their, their uh, in, in, by the end of this year, broadly people are at or close to, or in some cases above, their estimates of longer run neutral interest rate. Okay. So that should, that should stop pushing that that should in other words that should be a removal of accommodation for monetary policy basically at the same time we will have done significant balance sheet runoff and you can think of that as as further uh, in the next year and just looking at the median you're now above uh, the you know above the the what people estimate to be the longer run median so so and and also in in many people's uh, Forecast that actually amounts to to you know tight policy under in real rates as well. So why doesn't why does unemployment remain at three and a half percent? You know it. Uh, it I mean a, a couple points. One is the connection between in 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 the economy we had before the pandemic. The connection between inflation and the level of the unemployment rate was was not very tight. But this is qu clearly what this is is an expectation that really it amounts to that the idea that wage increases which are now running above the level that would be consistent over the long run with 2% inflation, we'll move back down to, to levels which are still very attractive, full, full economy, kind, full employment kind of wages, but not, not, not to a point where they're pushing up uh, 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 inflation anymore. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of factors causing inflation to come down. Um, uh, and you know, the, the reality is there, there, there are many, many moving pieces and we don't know what will actually happen. But no matter what happens, this is a committee that is determined to use its tools to make sure that higher inflation does not become entrenched. And uh, so we, we are determined on that front and we'll deal with what comes. Uh, this, is an, this is a modal or, or most likely expectation, but we will we'll deal with what comes, whether it's better or worse. Thank you. Let's go to Chris Rugeber at the AP. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, well, let me follow up a bit on that. I mean, there are a lot of economists skeptical that you can uh, reduce inflation as much as you've penciled in without raising the unemployment rate. Um, and I'm wondering just what are the mechanisms you see in re in reducing demand? I mean, outside housing and autos, how do higher Fed rates uh, reduce consumer demand unless it's through uh, higher unemployment. Thank you. Well, um, if you take a look, take a look at today's labor market. What you have is 1.7 plus job openings for every unemployed person. So that's that's a very very tight labor market, tight to to an unhealthy level, I would say. So, in principle, if you were, if or if let's say that our tools work about as you described. And the idea is we're trying to better align demand and supply, let's just say in the labor market. So it would actually, if, if, if you were just moving down the number of job openings so that they were more like one to one, uh, you would have less upward pressure on wages. You would, have, uh, you would have a lot less of a labor shortage, which is going on pretty much across the economy. We're hearing from, from companies that they, they can't hire enough people. They're having a hard time hiring. So... Um, that that's that's really the the thinking there is we you know these are fairly well understood channels, interest sensitive, uh, and and basically across the economy we, we'd like to slow demand so that it's better aligned with supply, give supply at the same time time to recover and get into a, a better you know a, a better alignment of supply and demand and that over time should bring inflation down. And I'll say again though, uh, you know we don't have a, a perfect crystal ball about the future. And we're prepared to use our tools as needed to to restore price stability. You know, with, with as I mentioned in my opening remarks, without price stability, th there you really can't have a sustained period of maximum employment. It's 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 our one of our most fundamental obligations is to <clears throat> maintain and restore, in this case, price stability. So we're very committed to that. Of course, the plan is to is to restore price stability while also sustaining 
a strong labor market. That is our intention, and we believe we can do that. But we have to restore price stability. Okay, let's go to Scott Horsley at NPR. Uh, thanks, and I apologize if uh, this covers some of the same ground you just you just talked about, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I missed some of your answer there, but I, I have a follow-up question on the on the labor force. Uh, we have seen some gains in the prime age workforce in the last few months. I wonder what you anticipate when it comes to some of the older workers as the health outlook has has changed. Are we going to see more recent retirees following Tom Brady back in the workforce? And what would that mean for wages and inflation? It's hard to say. You know, the the what we what we saw in the last cycle was that over the course of a long, steady expansion, labor force participation outperformed expectations, and that was just a uh, you know it was it was a tight labor market, but it wasn't it was nowhere near as tight as this labor market. But it was a tight labor market, and so people stayed in the labor force longer. It wasn't so much people coming back in the labor force after retirement. That's not something that hap that happens in the aggregate very much. But so that's what was happening. And, you know, more labor force participation is tremendously welcome. And of course, our policy does not in any way preclude that. This, this is a situation where wages have moved up at the highest rate in, in a very long time. And people are able to quit their jobs and move to better paying jobs in the same industry or different industry. So it's a really attractive labor market for people. And once, you know, as we get past COVID well and truly, it becomes an even uh, more attractive one. So we hope that that will lead to more labor supply. That's a good thing for the country. It's a good thing for people. And, and it also will, re we think, help relieve some of, the, uh, some of the wage pressures that do put inflation more at risk. That last part is, is uh, you will, we'll have to see whether empirically it winds out, works out that way. But you know, in principle, it ought to help with inflation as well. It's not the only thing we're looking for, though, from inflation. We're looking for help from another different, a number of different uh, uh, places and, and, most importantly, from our own policy. Okay, let's go to Rich Miller at Bloomberg. <laughs> thank you, um, Michelle, and thank you, Chair Powell. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having some communication problems, so I... I've missed some of uh, the stuff you've said, and my apologies if this has been asked. Um, um, since the FOMC met in last January, uh, financial conditions have tightened markedly. Uh, equity prices down, treasury yields up, bond spreads risen, yield curve has flattened a lot, and even further this today, dollars up. Uh, is that welcome? And would you like to see more in order to achieve your goals? Thank you. So as you, as you know, policy works through financial conditions. That's how it reaches the real economy it, by just the mechanisms you mentioned. And um, remember that the, the, the financial conditions we had uh, for the last couple of years were a function not only of very aggressive and uh, appropriately so fiscal policy, but also highly accommodative monetary policy. The, the monetary policy settings that we put in place at the worst parts of the pandemic so it, it is very appropriate to move away from those. And yes, that will lead to some tightening in financial conditions in the form of, of higher interest rates and, and, and just the sorts of things. <clears throat> We're not targeting any, any one or more of those things, but financial conditions generally <clears throat> should move to, to a, a more normal level so that we, because we know the economy no longer needs or wants these very highly accommodative uh, uh, this stance, which, you know, so it's it's time to move to a more normal setting of financial uh, conditions, and we do that by moving monetary policy itself to more normal levels. When you say move to a more normal setting for financial conditions, that, that suggests to me that you want financial conditions to tighten further from where we are now. Did, am I drawing the right inference from that? Well, yes. So I would say <clears throat> we look at a broad range of financial conditions, and and of course, when we tighten monetary policy, we do expect that they will adjust in sync over time with monetary policy. It's not any particular financial condition, but a broad range of financial conditions. They will reflect to some extent. They reflect any number of things. But yes, we we need our policy to transmit yeah. to the to the real economy, and it does throw does so through financial conditions, which means as we tighten policy or remove accommodation so that it's at least less accommodative, that broader financial conditions will also be less accommodative. 
Thank you. Just a little housekeeping note. Those of you in this call may be having some tech issues. If so, I understand the broadcast is coming through clearly on www.federalreserve.gov. So you might go there for the audio. And now we'll go to Jean Young. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, I wanted to ask about the balance sheet discussion you've had at this meeting. Can you give us any more details? Um, did you discuss whether to cap um, runoffs and or whether to increase those caps over what period if, if there were any details? Yes, thank you for asking. <clears throat> so at our meeting today and yesterday, we made excellent progress toward agreeing on the parameters of a plan to shrink the balance sheet. And I'd say we're now in a position to finalize and implement that plan so that we're actually beginning runoff at a coming meeting. And that could come as soon as our next meeting in May. That's not a decision that we've made, but I would say that that's how, that's how well uh, our discussions went in the last two days. Um, uh, so a couple things just to add. We'll, we'll be mindful of the broader financial and economic context, context when we make the decision on timing. And we always want to use our tools to support macroeconomic and financial stability. We want to avoid adding uncertainty to what's a, a highly uncertain situation already. So all of that will go into the thinking of the timing around this. In terms of the, I, I, um, <clears throat> I would say this. I don't. I, I don't want to get too much into the details because we're we're literally just finalizing them. Um, but the framework is going to look very fam familiar to people who are familiar with the last uh, uh, the, the last time we did this. Um, but it'll be faster uh, than than we than the last time, and of course it's much sooner in the cycle than last time. But it it will look uh, it will look familiar to you and. Um, I would also say that there'll be, uh, I'm sure there'll be a, uh, a more detailed discussion of our, of our uh, in, the, in the minutes to our meeting that come out in three weeks, where I expect that it will lay out, you know, the, pretty much the parameters of what we're looking at, which I think will look quite familiar. Thank you. Let's go to Michael McKee at Bloomberg TV. Mr. Chairman, since uh, September of 2020, you've been operating on a monetary policy framework that let the economy run hot to bring unemployment down. Uh, that seems to be over, but I'm wondering how you would describe your reaction function now. Uh, what is it that the Fed is trying to do other than bring inflation down? And as in other words, is it uh, we're going to keep raising rates until it comes down to an acceptable level? Yeah, so I want to clear one thing up uh, again, and that is that nothing in our in our new framework or in the changes that we made has caused us to wait longer to to raise interest rates. What we said in the in the framework changes was, and this was really a reflection of what had happened for the preceding couple of decades. Actually, what we said was, um, if we see you know low low unemployment, high employment, but we don't see inflation then we're not going to raise rates till we actually see inflation. That's what we said. And that was the sense of it. There was no sense in which if we got a burst of really high inflation, we would wait to raise rates. That's simply not in the framework. In fact, quite the contrary. The, the, the framework is all about anchoring inflation expectations at 2%. So I do hear this, you know, that the framework, it really, I, I, we can't blame the framework. It was, it was a sudden, unexpected burst of inflation. And then it was the reaction to it, and uh, and it was what it was. But it was not in any way caused or related, uh, caused by or related to the framework. So come to today, um, you know, I, I think our our vision on this on the committee is very very clear. What we see is a a strong labor market. We see a labor market with a lot of momentum, great job creation, and we see the underlying economy strong. Uh, balance sheets are strong. Uh, yes, there are threats to growth from, you know, from uh, what's going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, in the base case, we, uh, there's a pretty broad expectation of strong growth. But inflation is far above our target. And you know, the, the help we've been expecting and other forecasters have been expecting from supply side improvement, labor force participation, bottlenecks, all those things getting better, it hasn't come. And so we're looking now to using our tools to restore price stability, and we're committed to doing that. And you see that, I think, in the summary of economic projections, and you see that in the decision we make, and you will continue to see it in the decisions we make going forward. 
If I could follow up by asking, I guess what you'd call it is the Paul Volcker question. Uh, you don't think unemployment is going to rise significantly, but if it does, does that temper your desire to keep raising rates? Well, the goal, of course, is to restore price stability while also sustaining a strong labor market. We have a dual mandate and they're sort of equal. Uh, but as I said earlier, you know, uh, price stability is an essential goal. In fact, it's a, it's a precondition really for achieving the kind of labor market that we want, which is a, a strong and sustained labor market. We saw the benefits of a long expansion, a sustained labor market. It pulled people back in and there, was, there were really no imbalances in the economy that threatened the long expansion. It just, the pandemic arrived. Just, it was just a completely exogenous event. So that's how we're thinking about it. We, we, we of course, want to achieve, uh, you know, price stability with a strong labor market. But we do understand also that really you can't have maximum employment for any sustained period without price stability. So we need to focus on price stability in particular, particularly because the labor market is so strong and the economy is so strong. We feel like the economy can handle tighter monetary policy. Thank you. Let's go to Brian Chung at Yahoo. Hey, Chairman Powell, hopefully uh, no tech issues here on this front. Um, wanted to ask just kind of the broad question about uh, how you are communicating what the Fed's doing here today to the average American who might not be reading the dot plots or understanding what the SCP is. How is the 25 basis point hike today and then the signaling on future Fed policy going to address the inflation that they're feeling at the stores on a daily basis? Sure. So I, I guess I'd start by just assuring everyone that we're fully committed to bringing inflation back down and also sustaining the economic expansion. We do understand that that these higher prices, no matter what the source, have real effects on, on people's well-being. And really, high inflation takes a toll on everyone, but it's really especially on, on people who use most of their income to buy essentials like food, housing, and transportation, where, um, I mean, we've all seen charts that show if, if you're a middle-income person, you've got room to absorb uh, some inflation. If you're at the lower end of the income spectrum, it's very hard because you're spending most of your your money already on necessities and the, and the price is going up. So, But it's punishing for everyone. So um, it has been a difficult time for the economy, but, uh, but we do anticipate that, that inflation will move back down, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it may take longer than we like, but I'm confident that we'll use our tools to bring inflation down. And you ask about rates. So the way the way that works, I would explain, is as we raise interest rates, that should gradually slow down demand for the interest-sensitive parts of the economy. And so what we would see is uh, is demand slowing down, but just enough so that it's better matched with supply, and that brings that will bring inflation down over time. That's that's our plan. Thank you. Let's go to Joe Ling Kent at NBC News. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you so much for taking my question and doing this today. Um, my question is a follow-up to what Brian just asked. What is your message to consumers out there who can no longer afford the basics due to this high inflation? Well, that is, yes, indeed. I mean, as I, as I just said, you know, I, I think we do understand very much, uh, and we very much take to heart that, that it's our obligation to, to restore price stability. And um, you know, we've had price stability for a very long time and, and maybe come to take it for granted, but now we see the pain. I'm old enough to remember what, what uh, very high inflation was like. And, um, you know, we're, we're strongly committed as a committee to not allowing this, this higher inflation to become entrenched and to use our tools to bring inflation back down to more normal levels, which our, our target is, is 2% inflation. So we will, we will do that. And um, I just would want people to understand that. And that's, but the way we do that is by raising interest rates and by shrinking our balance sheet. And so financial conditions will become at the margin less supportive of, of various kinds of economic activity. That will slow the economy while also allowing the labor market to remain very strong. And you know, the good news is the economy and the labor market are, are quite strong. And, and, and that means the economy, we think, can handle uh, interest rate increases. Follow up to that, you know, obviously the Federal Reserve walking this very complicated fine line, uh, trying to avoid a recession for the consumers out there who are worried about their jobs and a possible recession. What do you say to that? 
Well, I, you know, I, I say that our intention is to, uh, to bring inflation back down to 2% while still sustaining a strong labor market and that the economy is very strong. You look, if you look at where forecasts are, um, you, you, people are forecasting growth that's, that's strong within the context of U.S. potential economic output. Uh, so, and we expect that to continue. And to the extent uh, the data come in different, then of course our policy will adapt. But uh, we do believe that our policy is the appropriate one for this forecast, and we believe that we can bring down inflation. We believe that we can do so while sustaining a, a strong labor market. The, the labor market is, it's not strong in the ordinary sense of the world. We, we haven't, word, we, ha we have not seen a labor market where there were 1.7 job openings for every unemployed person. Or where there, if you add, uh, uh, if you add uh, job openings to those who are employed, that's actually substantially a larger number than the size of the workforce, than the number of people who actually count themselves as in the workforce. So this is a situation where demand is higher than supply. And when that happens, prices go up. Uh, and, they, and so we, we need to use our tools to move supply and demand back. And we, we, don't, we, we don't think we need to do this alone. There will be other factors helping that happen. But we certainly are prepared to use our tools, uh, and we will. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Simon at The Economist. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, sorry to take you away from inflation for one minute. Uh, may I ask about the, the sanctions on, on Russia and specifically the freezing of the central bank assets? Of course, that raises a similar risk for uh, other sovereigns around the world and their biggest companies potentially. Um, any concerns uh, about in the long term uh, how this might affect the dollar status as the preeminent global reserve currency? Uh, and in the past couple of weeks, have you had to deliver any kinds of reassurance uh, to other central bankers around the world? Well, so, of course, central bankers around the world are generally very, very uh, in favor of all of these sanctions. But let me, let me say this. Sanctions are really the business of the elected government. And that's that's true everywhere. So the, the, the administration, the Treasury Department in particular and other agencies, they 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 create these sanctions. We're there to provide technical expertise, but they're not. It's not our decisions, and and uh, so I, I'm I'm reluctant to comment on on sanctions really much because because again they're not they're not for us. We we have a very specific mandate, and these are these are really the province of of elected governments, as as I mentioned. So I'd have to leave it at that. So, sorry. Thank you. Let's go to Nancy Marshall Genzer at Marketplace. Hi, Chair Powell. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, you've been talking a lot about rising wages, which on the one hand is a great thing, but are we possibly seeing the beginning of a wage price spiral? So um, the way I would say it is this. We, we um, first of all, I, I would agree with the premise that wages moving up is a great thing. You know, it, it's, uh, that's how uh, the standard of living rises over time, and, it, and generally it's driven over long periods by rising productivity. Um, but um, what we have now, if you look at these, uh, the wage increases that we have, we look at a, uh, we're, we're blessed with a range of measures of wages that, that all measure different things. But right now they're all showing the same thing, which is that the increases, not the levels, but the increases are running at levels that are well above what would be consistent with 2% inflation, our goal, over time. And that may be, we don't know how persistent that phenomenon will be. It's very hard to say. Uh, and that's really, I think, the sense of your question about a wage price spiral is, is that something that's going to start happening and become uh, entrenched in the system? We don't, we don't see that. Uh, we, you can see, for example, in, in some sectors that got very high wage increases, um, early on, those wage increases looked like they may have, have, have slowed down to a norm, normal level. But it's but it comes back to, you know, what, what I'm saying here, which is there, there is a, there's a misalignment of demand and supply, particularly in the labor market. And that is leading to wages moving up at ways that are, that are not consistent with 2% inflation over time. And so uh, we need to use our tools to to, you know, guide inflation back down to 2%. And that would be in the context of, of an extraordinarily strong labor market. We, we, we think this, this labor market can handle, as I mentioned, 
uh, tighter monetary policy, uh, and and the overall economy can as well. But but yes, um, wages wages uh, are moving up faster than is consistent with two percent inflation. But it's it's good to see them moving up. But it wouldn't be sustainable over too long of a period to see them moving up that much higher. And that's because of this misalignment between supply and demand. We expect to get more labor supply. We did last time. We got more than we expected last during the last cycle. This time we've gotten much less than expected. So it's not easy to predict these things. But we do expect that we'll get people coming back in the labor market, particularly as COVID becomes less and less of a factor in, in many people's lives, uh, something we all uh, wish. Um, but th- So that's how we think about it. Thank you. And for the last question, we'll go to Don Lee at LA Times. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, I think you said uh, to the Senate uh, earlier this month that in hindsight, the Fed should have moved earlier. And it sounds like uh, t- today that uh, you don't think that the Fed is late. And I just wanted to uh, get uh, your clarification on that. And if it is, if you still think that uh, the Fed is behind the curve, how how much behind the curve is it? Right. So we are we are not um, we don't have the luxury of 2020 hindsight in actually implementing real real time decisions in the world. So uh, the you know so the the question is um, the, the the right question is did you make the right decisions based on what you knew at the time? But that's not the question I was answering, which is knowing what you know now. So I think if we knew now, of course, if we knew now that that these uh, supply blockages really and the inflation resulting from them in collision with you know very strong demand if we knew that that was what was going to happen then in hindsight yes it would have been appropriate to to move earlier uh, obviously it would be but but again we don't we don't have that luxury and then so with the, but that's a separate question from uh, from your other question which is behind the curve and I, you know I, I I don't have the luxury of of, uh, of of looking at it that way you know we we are we are um, we have our tools, powerful tools, and the committee is very focused on on using them. We're acutely aware of the need to restore price stability while keeping a strong labor market. And uh, what I saw today was a committee that that is that is strongly committed to achieving price stability, in particular, and uh, and prepared to use our tools to do that. We're not going to let high inflation become entrenched. The costs of that would be too high. And we're not going to wait so long that that we have to do that. No one wants no one wants to have to really uh, put restrictive monetary policy on in order to get inflation back down. So, frankly, it, it, the need is one of getting back up, getting rates back up to more neutral levels as quickly as we practicably can, and then moving beyond that if that turns out to be appropriate. And as you can see. It is appropriate in in the sense it, 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 to, to people's SEPs, they, they do write down levels of interest rates that are above their their estimate of the longer run neutral rate. And there's also a, ra- a range of estimates too, as you will see if you look at the details of the SEP. But thanks for your question. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. all. Thank thanks, you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, wow. Um, apart from the uh, interesting Cisco IT system there, I always thought Cisco was a was a really, really old system. Uh, we've got some interesting reactions to this. I mean, the obvious one is if you just look at the QQQ, this is the minute by minute chart we were looking at on the screen. I hope that was sort of useful to give you a guide of what the market's reacting to. And you can see this green line, which is where we started. This is the two o'clock, 39.59 uh, price point and we were at uh, 335 and we are now at 337 so we are indeed up in the market and the market panicked in a little bit initially on the number of rate increases that we were or we are promised that doesn't mean by the way they have to pull, go go through with it but that's the that's the promise here and if i can just find that note again i will show it to you i'll show you this new dot plot and what that really means where well, you can see how how uh, messy my uh, notes are. Where did it go? Where did it go? That's a very good question, isn't it? It's, has it disappeared? It seems so. Okay, we'll have to find it again in in just a moment. This is the power of Microsoft to eat your notes. Uh, but it was in the, uh, the, the document that they put out here. Here it is. 
Uh, let me just find it. Here is the dot plot. So basically, each dot means one member of the committee voting for where interest rates will be at the end of 2022. And you can see the consensus is where most of these guys are, and that is just under 2%. So 1.9% or so is what we're going to get. We're basically going to get seven interest rate hikes to the end of the year, and they are also going to start discussing at the next meeting in May when to basically put the money shredder on, right? So tapering is done. Next step is to actually stop buying as many government bonds as there have been, and that'll remove some of the money from international markets, sorry, from the US financial market. It'll put some pressure on US government yields and so on. So that's kind of what we are, what we are seeing here. It's broadly in line with what we were expecting. I, I think the 2022 sorry, 2023 rather statement of, you know, we're going to go up to like 2.8% or something like that. That's a little bit more aggressive than what we thought. But that makes sense because they want to like threaten the stronger action down the road so that we take seriously what they're actually putting out here. And therefore the market re reacts to this as they are really taking inflation seriously. By the way, before you run off, I want to encourage you to get your hands on Jeffrey's top 26 industrial stocks. Their buying opportunities is a completely free benchmark. And I prepare those for you to give you some start and guidance in some research and understand some new sectors you perhaps haven't looked at before. So go to felixfranz.org slash 26. It's completely free. Um, it looks not just like this, it is this. And I show you the gross margins, the ROCE, the interest coverage ratios, the long-term earnings growth, and so on. Of all these companies, you can filter it, you can mess with it, you can make your own copy of it. So do download that at felixfranz.org slash 2026. Um, I genuinely enjoy all the comments. I know we were basically having a chat in the chat, and I really appreciate you guys all uh, chipping in there and sharing your thoughts. Um, oh, this David, I believe, who summarized, David Potts, who su summarized this very, very nicely. He said, my feeling is that this is all good news because finally we know what the rates will be over the next two years. So no more uncertainty and stocks need to correct back upwards as it's been a bloodbath. And I think that really is, speaks a lot of sense, David. Well, well said. Uh, the only caveat here is that as inflation numbers will come in higher and higher over the next few weeks and months, at least that's my prediction because of energy and, 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 and everything else, and um, that could make us worry whether or not we're going to get half a percentage point increases at any of these or whether they will start the money shredder a little bit sooner. And um, I, I have a trading business as well, for example, and all the shipping companies are sending my logistics team messages that you can't use Russian liners. You can't work with anything that goes through Russian or Ukrainian waters or the Black Sea. Anything insured related to Russia is gone. Any Anything flagged with Russia is gone. So what does that mean? Well, a lot of aluminium, for example, comes from Russia, right? That vehicles get built with and all sorts of other things. Well, how are you going to get it out of Russia if you're not allowed to transport it out of Russia because your insurers have said no? So there are all of these disruptions that are still very, very much here and that will have a knock-on effect over the next month or two or three or even longer as a lot of the big users of these raw materials have forward um, contracts. So they hedge themselves a little bit like if you're an airline, you don't buy petrol, uh, sorry, fuel every single day. You make a contract for the next six months or 12 months to have some certainty. So that is the one uncertainty that's going to come in here. I think overall, the statement sort of came out a bit bullish and a bit like, you know, we know what we're doing. And then Powell kind of smudged the whole thing over with the, but we will take into account the data that comes out as it comes out and we will adjust accordingly. Each meeting is a live meeting. He said that a few times. And I think that's kind of why the market sort of recovered from this uh, initial shock quite nicely. And the day is, is, is kind of fizzling out here very nicely. Look at that. PDD up 56%. Baba out up almost 35%. All the Chinese equities absolutely flying. Neo's up 24% to 1850. Who would have thought that two days ago? And basically look at these massive, massive numbers. Facebook up 5%, PayPal up 5.7%, Amazon up 3%. The banks are up, QQQ up 2.8% overall. The only thing that's down on touch is Activision and CrowdStrike and 
the volatility index is down some 9 or 10 percent here, 9 percent to 27 dollars. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that our options trades today got so much more profitable, and it's probably time to harvest some profits tomorrow, which of course I will do, and I will live stream it to all of my students. I saw many of you on the chat here, Nazi, for example. Thank you for all the comments, and thanks for joining our financial, as rather our master options program. It's a great place to start earning passive income. If you want to check it out, it's right here. It's completely risk-free as all my programs because I want you to get to financial freedom fast and in a secure and safe way, having full confidence in knowing what you're doing. And unfortunately, you don't get taught that by whatever schools, institutions, even business schools that you attended. Uh, they don't teach you this stuff. So you have to learn it yourself. You have to take it into, into your own own hands. And I'd encourage you to, to check it out. As I say, it's completely risk-free. All my programs are. So check out felixfrenz.org slash options. I genuinely appreciate you um, joining us here. You can also book a call with us with um, our lovely Cheryl, who's been with me for over 10 years and will guide you through and answer all your questions and concerns. And will also tell you if something isn't right for you, we, we don't try and push programs on you here. We do quite the opposite. We just want to make sure it's what you need, what gets you to your target and to your financial targets, your financial goals in a safe and, and conservative fashion, yet giving you great results. That's really the mantra here. So I genuinely appreciate you all tuning in, taking some time here to watch something that probably most of you don't watch every, every couple of months, FOMC meetings. They are, however, quite insightful, and it just means you get the information firsthand, and that's way, way better than reading, you know, a couple of hundred words on Reuters or something. I'm not saying Reuters does a terrible job, but, you know, they have to fix the whole thing into a couple of hundred words, and they have to basically come up with a headline, whereas if you watch the full thing from the horse's mouth, you get a more balanced approach, and you understand what is really being said here rather than just this headline, Fed hikes interest rates, uh, signals aggressive battle against inflation. You know, you have to use words like that, otherwise nobody clicks on anything. I have discovered that over the last year and a bit, and I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate all of you who are subscribers and Patreons and course members, and uh, thank you for tuning in and see you on the next one.